Well, hello. Pastor Paul here, and I want to welcome you back to our study entitled Christianity Explained. And we are simply looking at this question. <clears throat> what does it mean to be a Christian? And uh, I'm taking this opportunity to share with you uh, what it means biblically to be a Christian and why I've decided to be a Christian. And, uh, and so <clears throat> this is lesson four. Wow, can you believe it? We've already made it through half of our six-week commitment. And so I want to congratulate you for that. Now, uh, at the end of the first three lessons, I had given you a reading assignment. And you were reading uh, the book of Mark. And so, uh, if you're on track, then you've probably already read through the book of Mark. Remember, there's these four uh, biographies, if you will, um, that are inspired by God of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, we've been studying Mark, the second of the four Gospels. Now, uh, if you were sitting across from me and not watching on a video, it would be at this time that I would ask you to give me some questions from your reading. Uh, not that I can answer all of those by any means, but we would work together through your questions. And so, again, I encourage you, if you've gotten behind in your reading, then, uh, you know, that's okay. Um, you can continue to read through the book of Mark, and I also encourage you to reach out to a local pastor or someone that uh, yeah, that you know walks with Jesus and is a Christian um, you know, and, and let them help you answer your questions. Now, let's just quickly review some of the things that we've said in our study so far. You know, we began picturing Christianity like the seat on a three-legged stool. And we said that, you know, you don't have to be a mechanical engineer to know that a two-legged stool won't stand. And you know, Christianity is the same way. To be a Christian in a biblical sense of the word requires that we understand and place our faith in all three of these fundamental pillars of truth. And the first one in lesson one was that Jesus is the Son of God. And we also said that you could equally say Jesus is God the Son, and that's quite a claim. What makes Jesus any different from any other religious leader? And what gives Jesus the right to call himself God the Son? Well, we saw in our first lesson that it's his authority. And let me just quickly walk you through some of the ways that we saw Jesus having an unparalleled authority. First of all, as a teacher, he did not teach as the scribes and the Pharisees taught, but he taught as one having authority. Uh, next, we saw in Mark chapter 1 that Pete, uh, Jesus had authority over sickness to heal Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. It was a supernatural type healing. Remember, she got up and waited on them, which means she prepared them a meal immediately following the fever leaving her. Uh, then over in uh, Mark chapter 4, we saw Jesus has authority over nature. Even the wind and the waves obey him. And uh, of course, in Psalm 89, verse 9, we saw that God is the one who controls the surging seas, even the waves obey him. Authority over death. Boy, isn't that good news? Jesus has authority over death, and he brought Jairus' little girl back to life. He was a synagogue leader, remember? And he fell at Jesus' feet, pleading for Jesus to come and and heal his daughter, but by the time they got there, she had already died, and they already had the mourners in place, and they laughed at Jesus when he said he was going to wake her up, but he had authority over death. Then we made another column. We looked at Jesus' authority in the supernatural realm, authority over demons, over evil spirits, and, and they were afraid of Jesus, and they knew who he was because he created them, and, and uh, of course, they were angels, and then they rebelled against God, and they followed Lucifer, and they fell. They became demons, but Jesus had authority over evil spirits, and this was good news. Jesus told the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Wow, that claim caused the religious leaders of the day to say Jesus was a blasphemer. They knew 
Only God can forgive sin. But Jesus had authority to forgive sin, and he proved it by healing that paralyzed man. And then, we end it here, Jesus has authority over people. You know, Jesus has authority to come to you or to me and to say, come follow me. Jesus has that authority. You know, we ended this lesson just kind of thinking about not only who Jesus is, but what is our response to his authority. We said that sickness never said no to Jesus. The wind and the waves never say, no, Jesus, I don't respect your authority. We said that demons never look at Jesus and say, no, I won't respect your authority. I won't submit. But you know, people are the ones, and you and I know people. Maybe you've been this person. You know, the truth is, we're all born separated from God by our sin, bent away from him with this natural inclination to reject his authority. So that lesson ends uh, with some tension in our heart over who Jesus is and then how we in our natural state respond to his authority. Well, then we move to lesson number two, the second leg of this three-legged stool. And we said that when we were bent away from God and unable to, unwilling to reach out to him, he came to us. And, and the second leg of our three-legged stool was, of course, his crucifixion, the cross. We talked about how, you know, the cross of, of, uh, of, that Christians wear and hang on their walls and, and dangle from their necks is, is an interesting and unusual symbol for a faith. I mean, the truth is, a cross was an instrument of execution. It would be like wearing electric chairs for earrings. It would be like having pictures of guillotines and gallows on the walls in your home. So we, we really had two questions in lesson two. We talked about what's so special about the cross. Why would we have an instrument of execution as the symbol of our faith? And, and then we talked about, okay, what's so special about Jesus on his cross when thousands upon thousands of criminals were crucified on Roman crosses? Well, the first thing that we talked about uh, that indicated there was a supernatural event that day when Jesus died on his cross was the darkness. There was this three hours of unusual darkness in the middle of the day from noon to 3 p.m. Then we talked about the cry. And if you'll recall, we said this is really the heartbeat of the gospel. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, this caused us to pause and think, why would God the Father forsake his Son, whom he loves, clearly? He said, this is my beloved Son. He said it multiple times in the New Testament. Why did he forsake his Son in his hour of deepest need. Well, if you recall, we, we did an illustration. We called it the book illustration. And we, we just simply said that if, if this represents a journal of all of my sin, and it's laying on me, and it's separating me from God, and then he made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, the God-man, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And we said that in that moment when my sin is on Jesus, not only mine, but the sin of every man, woman, boy, girl that will ever turn to him in repentance and faith, that sin is on Jesus. And God the Father is pouring out wrath, paying the debt, canceling the debt, satisfying the justice of God. You know, there's a theological word, it's the word propitiation. That word means Jesus, says, Jesus was satisfying the, the penalty. He was satisfying the wrath of God on our behalf. And now we can wear his righteousness. And so that cry was very important. You know, I may have failed to mention to you that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That cry is the opening verse in Psalm 22, verse 1. Psalm 22 is the opening verse. It's a psalm of David nearly a thousand years before Jesus. 
He was clearly sat, clearly bringing to pass the promises of the Old Testament. Then we talked about the curtain. And you'll remember uh, we talked about how there was an Ark of the Covenant and the lid was the mercy seat and there were angels that overshadowed the mercy seat behind the veil in the temple in the Holy of Holies. And once a year, the high priest would go behind the veil and and he would sprinkle blood of animals on the mercy seat, but the veil continued to hang, separating the presence of God from his people. And, and on the day Jesus died at 3 p.m., the Bible says that the curtain was torn from top to bottom, that God had removed the barrier between himself and mankind. And finally, we talked about the ransom. We said that, you know, in Mark 10, 45, Jesus said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, in the Roman Empire in the first century, the economy was driven by slavery. It was not racial slavery per se. It was an economic slavery. And if someone had a debt they couldn't pay, they would become a slave to the to the one that they owed money to. And, and we said that if if someone came along and paid off a, a slave's debt, then he or she could go free. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He paid our debt. He canceled it at the cross. He was paying our ransom. And so uh, now we understand why uh, the cross is so important to us as Christians. It's because it was at the cross that our eternal debt was paid in full, Jesus said, it is finished. Now, last week, we went to the third leg of the stool, and we said that the final of these three fundamental truths is simply this. Jesus did not stay dead. He rose again. And, and the, so the resurrection is the third pillar of truth upon which Christianity stands. And, you know, we talked about the fact that in the Gospels, all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have a, 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 a historical account that Jesus raised from the dead and the tomb was empty. And not only that, that there were people who saw the resurrected Christ. And as a matter of fact, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the fact there in the verses like, the three, four, five, six, he talks about the fact that 500 people all at the same time saw the resurrected Jesus. And most of them were still alive to vouch for that fact when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in the early 50s. Then we said that, you know, the, the resurrection and its implications for you and I was the real topic of conversation when Peter sat down with a Gentile man named Cornelius and began to share the gospel with him, much like I'm doing with you. And, and we saw in Acts chapter 10, verse 42, that if the resurrection is true, which I believe it is, then that means that all people will be raised. Why do we say that? Because Peter said that the resurrected Christ said, Go and preach to the people that all people, the living and the dead, will be judged, right? And we said this, that when we say all people will be judged, we don't necessarily mean condemned. We simply mean this, that Jesus will be the judge and he will make a determination. He will make a decision. He will make a, a give a verdict and, and he will say whether or not we are his or we are not his. We are wheat or we are tares. We are sheep or we are goats. In other words, there's only two verdicts, accepted or rejected. And this is a very, very heavy uh, realization that all people will stand before Jesus one day. The Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is the Lord. But on that day, those that are rejected will be declared uh, that they don't belong to Jesus. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. 
And that decision will be final. And we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1, verses 8, 9, and 10, that the, the destruction, the, the second death, uh, hell, is, is an eternal kind of punishment. And, and so this lesson kind of ended last week with us realizing that how Jesus responds to us on that day it depends on how we respond to him today in this life. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And there will be no second chances after death. There will be no purgatory. Uh, that, that, that principle is not taught in the Bible. That now is the opportunity to respond to Jesus in repentance and faith. And so we have finished these three lessons, and I've just quickly given you an overview of what we learned in, in those lessons. Now, if you missed one of those, please go back and watch the video because there's a lot of detail that I wasn't able to cover in that quick overview. Now, in lesson number four, I want us to begin. I want to ask you a question. Now, I made you a commitment early on that I wouldn't ask you Bible questions, and I'm not going to do that now. But I'm going to ask you a personal question, really two. And so uh, grab a sheet of paper if you would, uh, or you could write this maybe on your phone. But um, let me ask you two questions. And you can pause and, and uh, pause the camera after each question and uh, pause the video and, and, uh, and take, some, take some time and think through your answers. So number one, do you know for certain that you have eternal life. That is, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? I know that's a heavy question, but it's, it's, it's personal. It's a question for you. Do you know for certain that you have eternal life? In other words, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? Pause the video and, and jot your answer down for just a moment. And then here's my follow-up question. Question number two. Suppose you were to die tonight and you stood before God in heaven and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? That's question number two. It's an opinion question. This is your response. If, if you were to die tonight, and, and you stood before God in heaven and, and he asked you, Bill, Stephanie, George, Harold, why should I allow you into heaven? What would you say? Pause the video and take a few minutes and just jot down your answer. You know, <clears throat> I've asked this question literally to hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, a lot of people have said, Pastor, I do just don't know. I don't know if I would go to heaven. You know, some have looked me square in the face and said, no, I'd go to hell. Some have said, yes, I, I know for certain I have eternal life. I'm going to heaven. But you know, I want us to focus on that second question. It, it's hypothetical, certainly at this point, but I think it's something that we should think about. You know, there are questions that you can afford to miss, to get wrong, right? I mean, I, um, I've i told this story before that when I was in college at the Georgia Institute of Technology and I was working on an engineering degree and my my girlfriend at the time, who would later become my fiance and my wife, Miss Brandy, she went to class with me. She was studying early education at West Georgia College, and uh, she went and sat in with me on a on a physics test at Georgia Tech one time. It was a lecture hall full of three or four hundred students, and 
she actually went with me and took the test. Now, there were so many people in the room that the professor was not able to discern that she wasn't really in the class, but I remember the next week I picked up her uh, exam and and uh, looked at what she did, made on the, on the quiz, and she didn't do very well. Now, uh, that's not knocking her because she was not studying physics at the time, but my point is this. She missed all those questions, but you know, they didn't really have eternal consequences. But if we were to miss this question, God looks at us and says, tell me, why should I let you into my heaven? We can't afford to get the wrong answer, can we? I mean, that, that's a question of infinite consequence. So I, I want to submit to you that there is a wrong answer. There's a wrong answer to that question. And before we look at the fact that there's also a right answer, let me just talk to you about what the, the wrong answer is. The wrong answer would be what we call salvation by works. Salvation by works. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? Well, let me show you what's in this envelope. See, in this envelope is another envelope that's entitled, What I Have Done. You see, if I stand before the Lord and I begin to talk to Him about all that I have done, well, these are, these are all my good works. That's the wrong answer. And so you say, Pastor, what's in that, that, that small envelope? Well, let me just show you what's in here. I've got in here my list. This is my list of all my good works. Well, let me just read some of them, and I don't have all of mine listed here, but I attend church. I'm a good person. I don't lie, steal, commit adultery. I take good care of my family. I'm a good neighbor. You know, my list could go on and on. I, I've got some good things that I've done. I, I, I'm a pastor. I preach sermons every week. I taught Sunday school when I was just, just out of high school. I taught junior high kids, and I've served the Lord in His church faithfully ever since I became a Christian. I, I, I could go on and on. I've never been drunk. I mean, these are just some of the things that I would put on my good works list. But here's the problem. If I stand before the Lord and I talk about all the things that I have done, that's the wrong answer. It's the wrong answer. Now, you say, Pastor Paul, um, you know, appreciate your opinion on that, but show me that in the Bible, and, I, and, and we should. We should look at that in God's Word. Let me just take you back to the book of Mark for a few minutes. Mark chapter number 7. Now this is a passage you've probably already read as you did your reading assignments. Mark chapter number 7. And let's look, if you would, at verse number 20. Mark seven twenty. If you're using, by chance, this NIV paperback, I'm on page 704. Mark 7, 20 says this, He went on, this is Jesus speaking, What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Boy, that's a pretty ugly list of things that come out of a man's heart. You know, God's standard is perfection. The Bible says in the book of Habakkuk that God can't even look on sin. He can't even look at it. 
As a matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of Psalms that not only does God have a hatred towards sin, but it even says this, he has a hatred towards sinners. Why? Because his standard is perfection. 100% infinite holiness. That's his standard. And, and so we, we look at Mark chapter number 7 and we see these things that we do that are evil. They come from our heart. What's going on there? Well, if we go to Romans chapter number 5, and maybe you could just flip over there. Romans chapter number 5, and I'm on page 785 in the paperback Bible. Romans chapter 5. Paul said in verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. You see, what Paul is teaching here is that that one man, that was Adam. You know, way back in the Garden of Eden, Eden, Adam disobeyed God. And when he did, Paul says that Adam sinned on our behalf. In other words, every human being born after Adam and Eve, and that's all humanity, we were born with a death sentence. That's what Paul just said. That when Adam sinned and died, that all died. Because, see, we inherited his guilt and his nature. And this is what Jesus is talking about when he says that all this evil, it comes from inside. Ms. Brandy and I, we've raised... Well, we've raised two children, and we're in the middle of raising three more. We've got five children. You know, we haven't had to sit down and teach any of them how to lie, cheat, steal, be selfish. Well, it just comes natural to them. Where do they get that? Well, they get that from their mother. No, I'm kidding. They get that from Adam. They get that from their mother and their father. You see, we're all born bent away from God. You know, the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As a matter of fact, Paul said this in Romans chapter 3. He's quoting the Old Testament book of Psalms. As it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. It says this, there's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Not even one. And, and so here's the point. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you take your child to the doctor. Let's say your little girl or your little boy has little red bumps, a, a rash all over his or her body. And you go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, I think I can help you. And the doctor goes and, and he steps out of the room and he's gone just a minute. He comes back and he's got a package of band-aids. Maybe they're Little Mermaid band-aids. And the doctor begins to put band-aids on each one of those little red dots and all up his or her arms and down his torso and down her legs, band-aid after band-aid after band-aid. Finally, you look at the doctor and you say, what are you doing? You know, you're beginning to lose confidence in the doctor, right? Sir, ma'am, uh, the problem is not the, the little red bumps. That's a symptom. The problem is obviously inside. My child has something going on in his bloodstream, and that's the point here. The reason that all these good works, what I have done, is the wrong answer is because our problem is inside. It's in our bloodstream. We're born with it. Let me show you another verse that helps us realize the reason works is the wrong answer. Go back to Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah 64. Isaiah chapter number... 64. This is page 519 in the paperback. 
And <clears throat> listen to what Isaiah says in 64, beginning in verse number 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. And so what God is saying here through the prophet Isaiah is that even our very best good works, the very best we can do to honor God compared to His holiness, it's like a filthy rag. Could you imagine trying to clean a window with a, an old oily rag? You can't do it. And so uh, our very, very best acts of righteousness compared to God's holiness are filthy rags. Why? It's because of the condition of our heart. We're born with a depraved heart, a wicked heart, and the problem is inside. Let me just show you one more passage that really drives this home and, and just makes it so clear. Uh, Ephesians chapter number 2. Now, this is page uh, 815 in the paperback NIV. Uh, Ephesians chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 8. Paul said this, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. And so this takes me now to the right answer. Now remember the question. The question is, suppose that you died tonight and you were standing before the Lord and He said to you, Bill, Julie, tell me, why should I allow you into my heaven? What would you say? Well, there is a right answer. And the right answer is salvation by grace. Salvation by grace. You say, Pastor, what's in that envelope? Well, of course, another envelope. It's not what I have done. It's what Christ has done. It's not what I've done. It's what He has done. And you say, well, what would that be? And this is probably one of my most favorite moments as I teach this study. Can you see that? You see, it's the three-legged stool. And this is exactly why we spent three weeks looking at the fundamental truths of the gospel, of Christianity. You see, it, it all boils down to what Christ has done. That Jesus, God the Son, came and died on a Roman cross. Not just a physical death, certainly that was terrible. But He died our spiritual death, the second death the eternal, infinite, holy, righteous wrath of God was taken upon Jesus on our behalf. And then He rose again to prove that He was who He said He was, and He did what He said He had come to do. And so, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. We're saved by what Christ has done. Now again, let me read... Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Paul said again, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. We saw that in Isaiah 64. No one rouses himself to call on the name of God. God has to come to us because of our depravity. And he says this, <clears throat> Let me start over. Verse number 8. 
For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So none of us are going to get to heaven and say, Oh, wow, the reason we made it is because of I, I did this or I did that. No, we've got no reason to boast. It's all His grace. Now, this leads me to a, a question that we need to consider before we close this lesson. Based on what we've seen today from God's Word, maybe we could say the formula for salvation would be something like this. By God's grace... Through my faith, I'm saved. Salvation. Now we could say, well, there's the formula right there for salvation. By God's grace, through my faith, I'm saved. And we could say that we don't see works anywhere on the page because we're saved by grace through faith not works. And this would lead us to say, actually, works are not involved in the equation whatsoever. That means I can do whatever I want to do. I can live however I want to live. That means my sinful works don't matter because I'm saved by grace and my sinful works are not going to keep me out of heaven. We could say that. But do you think that sounds like the God that we serve? Do you, do you think that sounds like what the Bible would teach, that by God's grace we're saved and now we can just live however we want to and our works don't matter? I want to cross that out because the truth is that's not what the Bible teaches. Well, maybe we should word it like this. Maybe we should say, by God's grace plus my good works, Through my faith or in the presence of my faith, I'm saved. Salvation. Maybe that's the formula. Maybe it's grace plus works through faith leads to salvation. Let's think about that formula. Well, actually... We know that can't be right either. Because we just saw clearly from God's Word that it's grace not works. And this equation says grace plus works. But Paul just told us in Ephesians 2, you're saved by grace, not works. So we're going to have to X that one out. That can't be right. Well, let's try one more time here. What if we said, by God's grace... Through my faith, I'm saved, and I produce good works. Let me let you consider this equation. By God's grace, through faith, I've been saved, and I do good works. Now this, friends, is the biblical equation for salvation. By God's grace, through faith, I'm saved and produce good works. You see, we've got to get works on the right side of the equation, on the correct side, which happens to be the right side of the equation. If we put works over here on the requirement side on the left hand side of the equation well we've just produced every other religion on the planet and now we're tag teaming with God right he's gonna do his part we're gonna do our part we're gonna work together like like a like doubles in tennis but the Bible says that's not the right answer if we say <clears throat> It's grace through faith, I'm saved and my works don't matter. Well, that flies in the face of the Bible as well. As a matter of fact, let me just read Ephesians 2.10. This is the very next verse after Paul said, 
We're saved by grace through faith, not works. Listen to what he said in verse 10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Look at that. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so now I can flip back to the book of James, uh, chapter number 2, and show you what James said about the idea of works and how it fits into the equation. <clears throat> James chapter number 2, beginning in verse number uh, 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no works or deeds? Can that faith save them? And so James goes on to say that faith without works is dead. And so we see that the biblical equation is that grace through faith leads to salvation and good works. And the good works are the evidence of true salvation. The good works show the, the legitimacy of true salvation, the authenticity, the genuineness of true salvation. And so, as we close, I want to encourage you to consider making your own set of, of envelopes. Now, let me, let me show you what you can do. You can pick up a normal letter-sized envelope and then a, uh, a smaller envelope. You can buy these at the Dollar Tree for get a whole box for a dollar. And then cut out some cards uh, and put your good works card on list on one card and then draw your three-legged stool on the other. And you could very quickly, probably with supplies you already have in your house, you could make a set of these envelopes. And you could keep them in your car, in your glove box, or or your console, and, and be ready. You know, keep them in your pocketbook, ladies, or whatever, and be ready to share the gospel with those who ask about how to be right with God. You could even ask them the key question, right? If you were to stand before the Lord, if you were to die tonight, and he said, Joe, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And you could say, you know, there is a wrong answer to that question and write that on your envelope wrong answer and hold it up and show them and say the wrong answer is works salvation by works and then what are you going to put in there well you're going to take a small envelope and you're going to write on there what I have done and I encourage you to Make this set of cards and then put you a little good deeds list in there. This is what I have done to make myself right with God, right? So we'll put that in there. The problem is my works is the wrong answer. And then, of course, you'll take your other large envelope and you'll put a big check mark and you'll write the words right answer. And you'll turn it over, and here it'll say, Salvation by Grace. You know what goes in there, a small envelope that, that says, not what I have done, but what Christ has done. We know what goes in there, the three-legged stool, right? This is what Christ has done. So we'll simply put all this together. And now you have a very simple yet powerful tool to share the right answer and the wrong answer to that question. Well, I want to close out by giving you some homework. We've got uh, a much smaller reading assignment this week. Uh, I want to give you four passages. I'm going to write these down and, and hold it up for you, and you or you can jot them down now. I want you to read Mark 
115. Now you've already read it, but I want you to look back over it. Mark 9, 43 to 48. Mark 8, 34 to 38. And Mark 10, 29 to 31. This is your reading assignment this week. Mark 1, 15. Mark 9, 30, uh, 43 to 48. Mark 8, 34 to 38. Mark 10, 29 to 31. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like for you to uh, circle or underline what you might consider to be the most important words in each of those passages. Very simple assignment. Read these on your own time and underline or circle the words in these passages that you think might be the most significant words in the passage. I am so thankful that you've decided to walk through these six lessons and uh, that concludes lesson number four. I look forward to seeing you next week. <music>